Hi, this is Rajiv Priyadarshi from PR3 Systems. Thank you very much for watching this video. In this video, we'll be talking about what's in knowledge catalog, how to activate data for AI and analytics with intelligent collaborative cataloging. The presenter is Rick Buglio from IBM, and he presented this at the IBM user group in Chicago. I'm sure you'll love it. Over to Rick. Uh, I'm Rick Bulio. I'm a, actually a digital technical engagement specialist. I actually work on Deb Jensen's team uh, and uh, you know create lots of great content uh, for our cloud offerings. Um, and uh, I want to uh, we're going to present to you today uh, the Watson Knowledge Catalog. Uh, this is our uh, SaaS based offering. So it's a full cloud managed cloud offering. Uh, it's a catalog that is going to uh, obviously allow you to view your data in AI uh, very easily. So one of the things I'm going to get to at the end of the presentation, just to let you know, is, you know, so why are we talking about Watson Knowledge Catalog? Uh, I know you all are information server clients. And uh, so we're going to talk about how Watson Knowledge Catalog and Information Governance Catalog um, are going to be uh, in lockstep with each other uh, as we move forward. Um, so, and the reason I say that is because of the legal disclaimer. So we will be talking about things that are future-based, but that are coming, uh, that are on our roadmap. So, um, you know, as a standard IBM practice, uh, we have to put up the legal disclaimer slide. And I know you, I know you all can read that. So, <laughs> All right, so before we can actually get into the solution, we really need to talk about how we got here. I mean, why is this important? Uh, you know, why are clients excited about it? Why are clients using it? Uh, and, uh, you know, what is the whole reasoning and purpose uh, for let's say, a cloud-based catalog, if you will? Um, so we know that, you know, this is, this is part of everyone's life today. Uh, you see it on every commercial on TV. It's a part of your life. You interact with it. You know, and every business uh, is embracing AI. Uh, we've talked a lot about AI and ladder to AI, uh, but business leaders everywhere are actually monetizing data uh, and they're developing strategies to really embed AI uh, in their business. Uh, number one, to help improve customer experience. Uh, number two, to predict uh, future uh, offerings and services uh, for their clients, but it's also helping to save lives uh, and helping to improve our lives. Uh, so AI is here to stay. AI is a reality, uh, and it doesn't matter what industry we're talking about. Every single in industry out there uh, is leveraging AI to really not only help improve their business, but help improve uh, their client experiences. Uh, and like I said, uh, you know, improve uh, our personal lives. And data and the combination goes hand in hand because, uh, you know, there is no AI without data. Uh, and data is uh, a new natural resource. Uh, and I think it was said very well by our CEO, uh, Ginny uh, Ramadi, uh, that you know, it promises to be for the 21st century what steam was for the 18th, electricity was for the 19th century, and what hydro hydrocarbon has been for the 20th. Uh, and she was spot on, she was correct. Um, you know, and, and based on IDC, you know, IDC's digital universe study, we can see here that the world's data is going to amount to 44 zettabytes by 2020. You know, what is a zettabyte? I mean, it's, a, it's an astounding number, right? It's like 10 to the 21st. It's like six, you know, one sextillion, uh, uh, sextillion bytes. Anyway, it's, it's a phenomenal number, right? Uh, and uh, the interesting fact here is that 10% of that data is actually coming from the Internet of Things. So, you know, we're all uh, armed with devices of some sort. Our houses are armed with appliances uh, that can send data back to the, uh, the mothership. Uh, so there's, a, there's an astounding amount of data that's available that data analysts, data scientists, and businesses uh, want to leverage. They want to get their hands on it. They want to be able to use it. Uh, they want to be able to use uh, data analytics, data science, and artificial intelligence uh, to take that data uh, and, and, and you know, start using it uh, to help them gain insights uh, into their business, into their client relationships, uh, et cetera. So we have you know, everyone going down the AI path. There's a, you know, zettabytes uh, worth of data uh, available, uh, but still there's obstacles that are keeping companies from exploiting uh, data and AI uh, for analytics. And why is that? So we know that nine out of 10 uh, businesses uh, actually require faster data in AI. So they need to be able to compete in a very competitive marketplace. Um, so a Harvard study that was done a couple of years back, uh, we talked to uh, you know, uh, quite a few clients, uh, nine out of 10 of those clients said yes, uh, we require, uh, you know, faster data and AI. We need to get the market quicker. We need to be more competitive. 
And then 40 percent of data professionals, and this is these numbers, you know, uh, really stand out for me because it really does present a ton of obstacles uh, that are preventing uh, clients from actually exploiting data uh, and AI. 40% of business professionals is time is actually spent fixing and validating data. So you think of quality stage uh, and, and the important work uh, that quality, quality stage does uh, you know, uh, in the information server platform. Well, think about a business analyst that really wants to get their hands on data uh, and you know, they want to do some analytics on it, but you know, they have to spend a ton of time uh, you know, uh, doing self-service, you know, fixing and validating of the data. Uh, and 80% of, of those analysts are actually sp spending their time doing, you know, integration type work, preparing that data, whether it's combining data together, uh, you know, it could be, you know, all kinds of different transformation functions just to make the data useful and fit for use before they can act actually start doing uh, analytics on it. Uh, so, and then I like to come to this chart because you know, then we go beyond that and we find that knowledge workers, so citizens analysts, knowledge workers, those folks actually doing the analytics, could be data scientists, could be business analysts, um, they're spending 80% of their time actually searching and finding the data. So before they can actually get to preparing that data and making that data fit for use and using it, they're actually out there looking for it, which obviously equates to tons and tons of hours of their time that actually could be spent doing analytics uh, instead of doing this task. So something needs to change, right? There needs to be a means for uh, you know, business users to be able to find data very easily, be able to prepare that data, and you know, get doing, uh, you know, spending 80% of their time doing analytics and, and flipping this on its head. Uh, and and you know, instead of spending all their time you know, looking for data, uh, fixing data, finding data, uh, and then you know, before they can actually use it. So we're presented with this obstacle, a vortex of data. Number one, coming in from everywhere, uh, you know, all kinds of sources, whether it's Hadoop, whether it's a data warehouse, whether it's on-premise structured data, unstructured data, social data, uh, streaming data, IoT data, the list goes on and on. Uh, and it's not organized and it needs to be pulled together because a lot of the times the benefit of bringing this data together is you want to combine this data with data that you already have in your data warehouse or on your on-prem uh, enterprise uh, data sources. Combining that data together now gives you a super valuable, very powerful set of data uh, that can extend your analytics even farther and make your AI uh, um, even more powerful. So, what if all that data was brought together, it was indexed, it was organized, and it was easily accessible to everyone that needs it when they need it? So, think of a library. And why is a library useful? If I were to walk into a library and there's a whole bunch of books just stacked on a table, it does me no good. I'm going to I'm going to spend hours finding what I'm looking for, uh, and eventually I'll get the you know what it is I'm looking for. Uh, but a library is valuable because it is cataloged, it's indexed. You can walk in, you can find by title, you can find it by author. Uh, you know you can check the book out, and then you can check it back in and get the next the latest version. So everything is uh, organized to make it your life easier to be able for you to access that information very quickly uh, and then be able to share it uh, and collaborate uh, with it uh, with the rest of the folks in the organization that are also part of these analytical projects. It's not just one person, it's a team sport. So all, there's a lot of personas that are, uh, you know, in, uh, that are going to contribute to uh, the AI and analytical life cycle. Uh, and that includes data engineers, data stewards, obviously data scientists and business analysts, but also application developers uh, writing code. So all the personas that are part of what's known as the traditional IT organization, they're still very much involved uh, in AI project and uh, analytical projects. They just don't go away. You know, they're not obsolete. Uh, they're still extremely valuable. But then you bring in new personas, right? The data scientists, the business analysts. Uh, who, who really need to get their, their hands uh, on that data and quickly. So it brings us to the Watson Data and AI platform, uh, a unified integrated set of tools, services, and data uh, that is available to all members uh, of the organization from one unified integrated platform. So we're gonna be focusing and diving down very deeply uh, into knowledge catalog and also the data refinery but also know that there's also a very valuable solution known as Watson Studio that is the environment to build, deploy, and learn 
uh, and, and do the data science and data analytics uh, that needs to be done and leverage the data uh, that's provided by the Knowledge Catalog. And at, at the center of this, uh, it's all powered by Watson. Uh, uh, number one, within the platform, we actually use Watson APIs to infuse some of the processes that are making it easier for you to ingest data, use data, and share data. But then also we have very tight integration into the Watson services. You know, a Watson Knowledge Expert, Watson, Watson Assistant. Uh, there's a whole slew uh, and long list of Watson services that can be leveraged uh, from within this platform. So it is one unified platform uh, and it exists of, you know, multiple solutions as well as a set of tools uh, and very importantly data. So at the, at the epicenter uh, of this unified platform is Knowledge Catalog. Uh, and it has the ability to discover catalog as well as govern the data uh, that is uh, part of the catalog. Um, and then you've got the ability to use the data refinery to do shaping, cleansing, and data preparation, self-service cleansing data preparation, uh, you know, that makes it super easy for end users to be able to prepare that data um, and get it ready for uh, analytics. And then it is very tightly integrated into all the, the uh, Watson uh, type uh, environments you see here on the right. So our Watson business solutions like voice of customer, uh, uh, our compliance assistant, which helps um, you know, um, with uh, uh, client uh, engagements. Watson machine and deep learning is a big part of this platform. So my point here is, is that, okay, so you've got this, the knowledge catalog that sits at the epicenter, right? And it is feeding uh, all of the activities that are surrounded uh, by it. Uh, Watson Studio being a big part of that, but then again, data refinery being a big part of it as well. So you bring that all together into one unified environment, makes it super easy uh, to be able to leverage AI and data uh, from one unified platform. So let's dive a little bit deeper uh, into uh, our you know, knowledge catalog. So knowledge catalog uh, has the ability to number one, discover data. Uh, discover data means going out and finding that data, seeking that data out, reaching into you know, a, a pre-built set of connectors, whether that data is on premises, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's a third party data source, uh, it doesn't matter where the data resides. Uh, the Watson Knowledge Catalog can actually go out and do automatic discovery on a lot of those data sources and help you bring in the metadata into the catalog without you having to do it manually. So there's an, there's an example of a Watson API uh, and service that we leverage to be able to go out and do that automatic discovery. So, um, you know, it allows you to go out and find and discover those, that data across uh, those different feeds, uh, wherever the data resides. So we don't bring data into the platform, we're bringing metadata into the platform. And that's what the catalog is all about. It's about indexing and organizing metadata so that you can get to that data, uh, you know, once you access that data set, uh, but the catalog is not storing data. The catalog is storing metadata. And then there's the cataloging functionality, which, like I said, is infused with a lot of automatic type methods. But we can easily catalog, organize, find, and you know, access all that information because we're bringing it all together in the, into one central catalog. And it's not just data. We can catalog models. We can catalog dashboards. We can catalog notebooks. We can catalog assets from third-party vendors like Tableau or Looker. Uh, so you can read, it's not just about bringing data uh, and we catalog both structured as well as unstructured data. But as soon as we catalog that data, then we start using again, some of the other uh, Watson capabilities to do auto classification, uh, to do uh, profiling, uh, to actually extend that metadata and give you additional usage statistics so you can understand that data and have great understanding of the context of that data so you can trust it uh, and then you know be able to use it uh, knowing that you know it's a trusted source uh, it's you know uh, obviously we know where it came from uh, and then you also know what other people are saying about it so there's all kinds of social capabilities that are wrapped around this uh, to be able to review it share it with others uh, and let others know you know the quality of the data where the data came from uh, and whether or not it's a useful data set to use uh, as you know part of your analytical project and then very importantly, it's the ability to protect that data as it's being accessed. So uh, there is an active policy manager that is a part of Knowledge Catalog uh, that actually has actionable policies and rules to be able to govern the data to either deny or allow access to an entire data asset or to go down deeper, 
to the column or the field level and be able to mask that data, anonymize that data, redact that data. Uh, so you can control who has access. You can also control who gets to, who gets to see what. Uh, and you know, depending upon what it's classified as, uh, you can classify this data to be sensitive. It could be personal identifiable information. It could be you know, uh, classified uh, information as well. So uh, however you choose to control the access, those capabilities are available to you with the governance layer that is part of the knowledge catalog. So discover, catalog, uh, and govern. And then that data is now available and integrated with, again, those Watson services that are doing the AI, like machine learning, like deep learning, uh, like you know, statistics modeling. Uh, or you know, you're building notebooks, uh, you're building uh, you know, code in our studio. Those tools are all available to you uh, in the integrated platform, and they have access to those catalog assets. So you can now take that data, put it into a project, and then share that data with folks that need it, and then they can collaborate on that data and start using that data in their data path. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a life cycle. It's the trusted currency of data with the Watson Knowledge Catalog. So uh, you know, again, you discover the data, uh, you catalog the data, which gives you a 360 degree view uh, of your uh, business data. Uh, so now it's all available to you uh, in one place uh, that allows you to easily find what you need uh, and then be able to use that data uh, as you need it. And then you put the governance layer on top and we can govern information assets uh, to ensure that those data assets are secure across your organization, uh, and then with policies in place that control the access to that data based on your business policies and rules. And we'll talk about the data refinery in a second and how uh, now, you know, all, now that you have this catalog of index uh, metadata and information, uh, how you can use it uh, in the data refinery to explore, shape, and operationalize that data. Uh, as well as be able to, you know, integrate that data uh, and AI with the Watson APIs and Watson Studio. So the data refinery, uh, and, and don't think of the data refinery as a data stage, by no means. But it is a very easy, self-service, spreadsheet-like interface that quickly allows end users to, you know, join data together, uh, you know, concatenate, split, uh, do calculations, you know, things that they're very familiar with and very used to. So most of these business users are used to, you know, using spreadsheets. Uh, so this is the spreadsheet like interface uh, that's built in to the solution. So I can take a data asset from the catalog now uh, and I can bring it into the data refinery and I can combine it with another data set that might not be of the same type. I could bring a spreadsheet, I could, I could, for instance, join a spreadsheet to a DB2 table. Uh, or I can join a, an Oracle table to a Microsoft SQL Server table, right? So the data refinery allows me to you know, interact with that data, bring that data together, even though it's not from like sources. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so it, you, it allows you to not only connect to data that's in the catalog or data that's in one of, a project uh, in uh, Watson Studio, but I can now reach out to any one of those data sources that were supported by the catalog. If I want to go out and reach into a data source and bring in an Oracle table now uh, and you know, start using it along with my other data assets, I have that capability. So again, it doesn't matter where the data resides, whether it's on-prem, in the cloud, or you know, part, uh, you know, could be on the Amazon cloud, could be in the Microsoft cloud. Um, we're going to ensure that number one, the data is protected as it's brought in to the platform uh, using you know, uh, encryption methods uh, for all data sources, uh, and then be able to leverage uh, those connectors and then share those connectors across all the Watson experiences. Now you can explore and prepare your data. You can uncover patterns and then refine your data, you know, using, uh, you know, a, a, a very robust set of shaping and cleansing techniques, uh, very similar to, you know, for instance, what you can do with data integration, uh, but, you know, not with, you know, the volume that a, a, a data stage, uh, you know, can handle. So the types of data, militia, data manipulation tasks uh, that you can do today are a lot of, they're very self-service, it's point and click. Uh, you don't have to know algorithms, you don't have to type in commands. Now, if you're an R programmer and you love to type in commands, you can do that, it, it allows you to do that. Uh, it does support uh, you know, the uh, R uh, functionality uh, within uh, data refinery, 
so that if you are a power user and you, you know you're you're very you're very much used to using R and using transformation functions in R, you can do that. But most of our clients, most of our users, they take advantage of that list of operations that's over on the left hand side. There's over a hundred of them that allows them to simply just, for instance, join two things together, do some calculations, you know, do uh, split two columns, do uh, you know, do some substrings, do some concatenations, etc. Uh, and then now that you've prepared that data, you want to save that data. You want to save the instance of that data preparation now. Uh, and then be able to, uh, before you actually make it available uh, to uh, end users, you can actually visualize what you've done. There's a interactive exploration and data visualization that's part of data refinery that lets you, you know, gain deeper insights from your data using tons of built-in charts and graphs. And we also make intelligent recommendations for you that says, you might want to use this graph to represent you know, your data now that it's been uh, transformed. So there's a whole visualization component of data refinery that allows you to build and save these graphs uh, and charts, uh, as well as there's also profiling and um, statistics built in for you, help you understand your data either be before you prepare it and then after you prepare it to see what, what your results are. So there's statistical techniques that are built in uh, to this tooling uh, that can or automatically detect and label data types, uh, it can classify data, and then it also does a lot of the same profiling that's done uh, in the knowledge catalog. Uh, so it allows you to discover anomalies with the data, uh, and it also uh, adheres to those policies and rules that have been enforced by the knowledge catalog. So I'll give you an example. If I go in and I, cl and I classify a data asset as sensitive, and then I set up a policy that says if you find any data asset or someone's trying to access a data asset that's been classified as sensitive, uh, I want you to protect all financial information and all uh, government identities and account information, which is basically saying I want to protect national IDs, credit card numbers, bank accounts, anything in that category. So it will automatically look at that data asset, look at the data classifications and discover whether or not, for instance, there's a social security number or a national ID, uh, and actually, I have three choices now. I can either deny access completely, or I can mask those columns. I can anonymize those columns, which basically gives it you know, a unique value, but doesn't look anything like the, the value that was there. Or I can redact it, meaning I can just put X's in it and, and just you know, exit out so nobody can see it. Um, so that's a good example of being able, and, and then once I do that, and, and once that masking has been done, if I take that data asset now and I, and, I, and I copy or I move it or copy it to a project, if I go to preview that data in the project, that policy is going to kick in. I'm not going to be able to see that data. It's going to be masked. If I bring it into the data refinery, it's going to be masked. If I manipulate that data in the data refinery now and then I take that data asset and I send it to another data source, which you have the capability of doing, uh, that data is going to be masked. So well, it adheres to that business policy and rule that's been defined as that data flows throughout the entire platform and also leaving the platform. And then you have the opportunity to deploy and operationalize what's known as a data flow. So you, you put together this transformation, maybe there's you know, 12 steps uh, in your data transformation recipe, uh, you save it, uh, you can run it immediately, obviously, or you can schedule it. Uh, to run on a repeated basis so that you get repeatable outcomes. So the data refinery is included with the knowledge catalog. It is a, por it is a component of the knowledge catalog, uh, and so it is there for your use. It's also included with Watson Studio. So if you choose that, you know, you want to, you know, whether you have knowledge catalog or you have Watson Studio, the data refinery is always going to be there for you for that data preparation step. And we can't leave this conversation without talking about Watson Studio because it is an integral part of the Watson data and AI platform. This is where all the heavy lifting takes place. This is where you actually build and uh, you build models, build notebooks, deploy those models, uh, and then consistently retrain those models and get those models to learn uh, on a recurring basis. So machine and deep learning services available uh, in the platform to craft those models and compare the results, run experiments, rerun those models, Open source technologies like uh, Jupyter Notebooks, Python, uh, Spark, um, that are all you know, part of the platform uh, because this is, a, this is an open platform. It does allow you to, for instance, bring in your own notebooks. 
Uh, it does allow you to, for instance, code in different programming languages. Um, you know, and a lot of them are open source languages. Matter of fact, I think we support more open source languages in Watson Studio than any other tool uh, on the market. Um, so again, easy visualizations, there's a, actually a built-in Cognos dashboard to do visualizations. That's part of Watson Studio. Uh, and then uh, it's, it's an all-in-one experience in that it's such an integrated uh, and seamless environment, you won't even know what solutions and what services you're using as you're going through the platform. Because the user interface is all the same. It's the same cons consistent experience, whether you're doing data science, whether you're using the catalog, whether you're using binary, uh, it has the same design patterns. Uh, and uh, you know, things just start appearing in the menus uh, as, as you start adding services, tools uh, to the platform. All right, so very importantly, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're coming to an integrated and unified catalog. So uh, today we have Watson Knowledge Catalog, which is a cloud-based fully managed service. Uh, now, Information Governance Catalog and Watson Catalog will be coming together as an enterprise catalog for our information integration, our, our unified governance uh, portfolio. So today, there's a lot of capabilities in Information Governance Catalog that are not available in Watson Knowledge Catalog and vice versa. So we're going to be combining the catalogs to be a unified enterprise catalog, bringing in a lot of uh, in, uh, IGC capabilities uh, into uh, Watson Knowledge Catalog. Uh, and the name of the catalog will be Watson Knowledge Catalog because of its brand and because of its recognition. We have like over 8,000 uh, downloads alone of Watson Catalog and uh, a ton of end users are already using uh, Watson Knowledge Catalog. So a couple of things that have already taken place though. So today, Knowledge Catalog and IGC can share technical data assets. So there is a bi-directional bridge that is part of Information Server 11.7 uh, that was introduced in 11.7 that allows me to set up a bridge between an Information Governance Catalog and a Watson Knowledge Catalog. Once that bridge is in place, then uh, I can actually share data assets between the two catalogs without me having to do anything. Meaning, uh, what, what I shouldn't say without me having to do anything. As I add data assets to Information Governance Catalog, they will appear in Watson Knowledge Catalog. As I, add, as I add data assets to Watson Knowledge Catalog, they will appear in Information Governance Catalog. The bridge is bi-directional and it's immediate. So as soon as those assets get cataloged, they appear in each other's catalog. The, the maintenance and administration of those objects are done from the, from the primary catalog that they were added from. Meaning if a data asset was added to Watson Knowledge Catalog from uh, IGC, I can't go in and remove it or change its properties. But I can go into IGC and remove it or change its properties and those changes will get reflected in Watson Knowledge Catalog. And the same holds true for WKC. If I go in and uh, add a data asset to Watson Knowledge Catalog, let's say, let's say add a table or you know, a, a connection even, um, that connection will now automatically appear in Information Governance Catalog. Well, you can't delete it out of Information Governance Catalog. You have to delete it from Watson Knowledge Catalog. So we respect the, uh, the authorization or the authorship, I should say, of where it came from. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's gonna, that's going to only get better over time where, you know, it, it'll just be seamless in terms of what you can do uh, as w in, in one unified catalog. Yes? Does it matter if one's on-prem or one's on cloud? So, no, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it, IGC is typically on-premises today, uh, and Watson Knowledge Catalog is in the public cloud, uh, so they communicate today. Eventually, uh, you know, you will not just have a cloud version of Watson Knowledge Catalog. You will have an on-premise version, and you'll also have the ability to run it in, for instance, you know, ICP for data, uh, as well as on a private cloud. So, so a customer could effectively, you know, if they're, if they're sensitive about their data source, they can run it through their on-prem IPC, or their you know, server or cloud, and do all the extra capabilities out of the Knowledge Catalog, and then so the question is, if a company, if 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 a, if a client is is you know concerned about the sensitivity of their data sources, they could add those to IGC uh, and then allow them now to be added to Watson Knowledge Catalog, as opposed to adding them from Watson Knowledge Catalog and have it go in the other direction. And and that's true. Yes. 
that oh. that's that's definitely that definitely uh, could you know be taken advantage of. Um, so today, and let me make let, you know, let, 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 and that's why I have really kind of coming soon here in this chart uh, is that we do have the sink in place today. The bidirectional sink uh, is there today. It supports all technical data assets, connections, databases, schemas, and tables. Right, that's a small portion of the assets that are available uh, in information governance catalog. It's also a subset of what's available in lots of knowledge catalog. Remember I said we can support models, notebooks, dashboards, and third party assets. Eventually, those, all of those data assets will flow between uh, and be part of one catalog. So, you know, so the next thing that's coming is really to bring in the business uh, objects within information governance catalog, specifically the business glossary uh, terms, uh, as well as, uh, you know, bringing the policy manager that's in Watson Knowledge Catalog, which is actionable into information governance catalog. So really kind of taking the technologies, bringing the best uh, of both breeds together as one unified enterprise catalog, uh, really giving that value and that benefit to all of our clients so that you don't have to say, okay, well, which catalog should I choose? Well, we have a lot of customers that are heavily invested uh, in information governance catalog and information server. So this allows them, number one, we've allowed them to extend into the cloud and start using Watson Knowledge Catalog. Now they can leverage their investment in IGC uh, and then just go with us on this journey as we migrate the two catalogs together. Question. Yep. In IGC, when you have got policies and rules, you are integrated with information advisor and quality stakeholders. Do you, have, do you plan to have this as an integration with Watson Knowledge Catalog in the future? So the question was, in uh, Information Server today, we have uh, policies and rules that are implemented into Quality Stage and uh, Information Analyzer. Uh, and are we, do we have any plans uh, on taking advantage of that? And the answer is yes. Uh, and the plan is, is to have one policy manager that can be used in either catalog until we get to a unified catalog. Uh, and then have those policies and rules not only be documentation, but also actionable being able to take an action based on a business rule or a business policy and a business rule that's put in place. We also want to take advantage of things that are happening in information analyzer and quality stage that we're not taking advantage of today in the data and AI platform, right? So we are using some of the information analyzer algorithms to do some of our classification and profiling along with some Watson APIs. We want to do more. We want to start bringing in a lot more of that. All right, so I just want to point this out that, you know, uh, IBM uh, Watson Knowledge Catalog was recently recognized by Forrester as the leader uh, in, what they, in what they categorized as machine learning data catalogs. So there's a lot of competitors uh, out there uh, on the market that fall into this category, and we were uh, the leader uh, in this category. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with our self-service capabilities as well as our governance capabilities. Um, so, um, so I would, you know, Encourage you all, I, I put a link here for you to go out and read the report. Uh, it's a very extensive report uh, and it and actually gives you a really good understanding of what all the other vendors do provide and why IBM was uh, you know, announced as the leader. And then I have to give DTE a shout out here. So I've left you some links here, right? It, there are some great digital technical engagement assets out there for knowledge catalog, for information governance catalog. There's also a ton out there for so for the Watson Studio and the Watson uh, services, as well as unified governance and integration. So take advantage of what's out there uh, and educate yourself um, and, and, and use uh, the assets. Mm -hmm.